welcome everybody uh, to this live session for those who were here earlier on today. Hello again. I am uh, Gabriella Di Laccio. I am uh, a soprano and also the founder of the project Donne Women in Music, which is a project that aims to support and promote women in music, specifically more uh, women, com female composers from past and present. And today we were going to have the great chance to talk to Amanda Cook. Welcome, Amanda. And for those who don't know Amanda, she's a Boston-based editor, writer and arts administrator with a background in flute, performance and higher education. She is the editor-in-chief of I Care If You Listen, the award-winning contemporary classical music magazine advocating for historically underrepresented artists and equitable programming. Her training as a performer coupled with her current work in music journalism and nonprofit administration uh, provides a unique perspective from which to view the current state of classical music. And we are so lucky to have you here. I'm so looking forward to this conversation and all the difficult questions we have here to ask you. Welcome, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I was so excited to hear from you. I was really glad that you emailed and I'm looking forward to digging into the difficult questions because I mean, I can't think of a better time right now as people are becoming more and more aware of these systemic inequities that we have. I mean, I, I think now is the time when we need to be really challenging ourselves to have these conversations. Exactly. And they're not that difficult, but it was going to be really interesting to hear from 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 your perspective, because you have um, a position which is so important when as an editor and a position of decision making in the business, which is uh, as a woman. And we are going to talk that about that in a minute. First, I wanted to just to hear a little bit about your background. How did you come into music uh, first as a musician and your transition later to become a music journalist and an editor? And how did you make that change? And what contemporary music is another special niche as well in music. So could you tell us more about that? Yeah, as you read in my little bio, it's it's been a somewhat circuitous roundabout route to where <laughs> I've ended up. It wasn't where I intended to end up at all. Um, so my training is as a flutist, and so I hold three degrees in flute performance, and I'm not necessarily using those degrees <laughs> right now. Um, but all throughout school, um, flute was the vehicle for getting me through through school. It was always the way that I primarily identified myself. I thought of myself as a performer first, who also happened to have interests in all of these other areas. Um, I think it was when I was doing my master's degree that I was really introduced to contemporary music because I had an assistantship at my university that required me to play in basically every ensemble that the <laughs> university had. Uh, one of those was the, the new music ensemble. So I think that was my first experience with contemporary music. Um, and I remember it just being um, a very almost empowering experience because I was so intimidated by it at first. And just looking at these scores that looked so different from anything mm -hmm. that I had seen before, but then just being able to break things down and figure out how to decipher different notation, um, how to just learn more about the composer's intentions and mm -hmm. just figure it out. Um, mm -hmm by the end of that experience, by the end of those two years, I remember feeling as if there was nothing that you could put in front of me that I wouldn't be able to figure out eventually. And that was a very freeing feeling. Um, so I think that was my first experience really with contemporary music. That's where I kind of caught the bug. Um, and then when I was doing my doctorate, that was when I started pursuing the public writing a little bit more. 
I've always been a complete nerd. I love school. I love writing papers. Um, and I think <laughs> normally when people pursue performance degrees, it's because they don't want to write the papers. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm that one. <laughs> but um, I mean, it was always just something I really enjoyed. I loved reading. I loved digging into all of the research. So I started my own personal blog that was related to flute things just because I wanted a public outlet for my writing. But then I saw, this must have been in about 2013 or so, it was, it was shortly after I started my doctorate that I saw this Twitter account, I Care If You Listen. I thought it was so clever because it's a riff on the Milton Babbitt essay, Who Cares If You Listen? Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought it was so clever and I really liked the content that they were putting out. So I started following this account and they put out a call for new writers. Um, so I had been blogging a little bit and reached out and I started writing as an album reviewer for them. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started with, with the organization. Um, so I, I finished my doctorate and I always imagined that I would end up as a university teacher. Um, mm -hmm. So I always Not imagined- Not as a performer. I'd... No, um, because to me, a university position is is the combination of all of my interests. I was interested in performing, but also teaching and also researching. So I thought that that was where I would end up. Um, but the higher education uh, situation here in the US is pretty rough. Um, a lot of universities are cutting full-time positions and only hiring adjunct professors, which is part-time, no benefits, no health insurance, semester to semester contracts. Um, there's just no stability in that. And I felt like I was always maybe one step behind where I needed to be. So mm -hmm. when I finished my bachelor's degree, you just needed a master's to be able to be hired for one of these positions. Once I finished my master's degree, you needed the doctorate. Once I finished the doctorate, you already needed to have a job in order to get a job. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 so I felt like I was always just one step behind. Um, mm -hmm. But I spent a lot of time applying for jobs and really didn't get anywhere with it. Um, I applied to so many different positions and, and didn't even receive a phone interview for anything. Um, so then it became time to start thinking about what else I might do. Mm -hmm. um, also at the same time, I ended up with what was fortunately temporary, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, I developed a tremor in my face and I couldn't play my instrument anymore. Hmm. <laughs> um, it has since healed, but that's part of the reason why I'm not really playing professionally right now. Um, hmm. So yeah, I just kind of had to really scrap all of my plans and figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up in nonprofit administration. So I work at a Suzuki music school right now. And I don't know how big Suzuki is in the UK as a pedagogical system. Well, um, I know I'm not from Brazil. It's very big in Brazil. So right. Maybe not so much here, but I know, yeah. Yeah, so I, I it's a nonprofit organization and they're a community music school. So I it's one of those jobs where you sort of have to do a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, so, um, so I am the person who's in charge of signing all of the kids up for classes, but I am also in charge of marketing. I also help out with development. I also help out with grant writing. So um, I've learned a lot about um, nonprofit arts organizations through mm -hmm. this job. And I've continued running. I care if you listen on the side um, because <laughs> starting as a writer, um, I then was asked to help with some of the editorial work and I've been the, the editor of the publication for about three years now. Wow, but that's a big change, a completely different job from the administration job because how, how much did you change do you feel like you changed since you uh, became the editor? 
of the magazine. How much the publication has changed or yeah. how much? Yeah. Um, your, 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 you as an editor, what was the change for the magazine? Did you feel there was a big change? Well, they were always been, uh, the magazine has always been so diverse anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I Care If You Listen has always done an amazing job of highlighting, um, you know, it's, there's never a good word for it, whether it be early career artists or emerging artists, there's never a good word for it. Um, but highlighting people who um, are bigger names in our field versus people who are not getting as much coverage elsewhere. Um, so I think the publication has always done a good job of making that balance. Um, but when I stepped into the editor position, I was doing a lot of listening to the conversations that were happening in our field and what, what people were asking for. And even three years ago, the conversations that we're having today were still happening, maybe just not as publicly, with mm -hmm. the need for greater diversity in arts organizations, with the need for greater representation. Um, so I just started listening to these conversations and I just started following a lot of people on Twitter and trying to figure out what it was that we could actually do with our platform because I realized it was a huge responsibility um, stepping into this editor position and just realizing that I had the ability to leverage this platform to maybe do some things that could inspire some real change. So in, over the past three years, we have put the majority of our focus into covering underrepresented and historically marginalized artists. And more recently, we have continued to hone that focus to our primary our primary priority being racial equity. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we are gonna, well, the title of our conversation is Practicing Intersectional Feminism. And for those who don't know the terminology, uh, intersectionality, I actually got the definition. Uh, it was actually a term coined by American professor, if you don't know her, you have to watch this TED talk uh, I actually separated the, the link here for you. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in 89. And of course, the concept of intersectionality already existed, but she just put a name to it. And basically, it's the, the view that women experience oppression in varying configurations and in varying degrees of intensity, like being a woman and having prejudice w with a race or class or ability or ethnic ethnicity and uh, this conversation is really interesting because while we are both white women uh, in, in and I have a, a platform for female composers but I'm also a singer and I feel very privileged even though I come from a third world country I'm a foreigner here and I have experienced a small level of prejudice but nothing compared with the other women uh, what they have to experience. So how do you make sure and, and how important it is for you to keep this balance between being in charge as a white woman and giving space for people? Because we, even though we, we think we know the, the voices, we, we don't really experience uh, what all these women are going to, or not only women, but uh, people. Well, how do we can we find a balance between being an an, an, an ally for all these voices but also um, giving them the space to speak for themselves yeah I mean that's something that I continually think about and struggle with and am conscious of and just trying to do my best in my position but I think the majority of it is is something that you just said which is knowing when to get out of the way and just provide the space and just provide the platform so i mean i i do interviews like this i i do podcasts to try to bring more awareness to the project but just on the actual platform itself i try as much as possible to just give a space for people's voices um and one thing that, that you and I were talking about briefly before we went live was the fact that um, even though on the platform we are trying to cover 
diverse artistic voices behind the scenes. Um, we are a predominantly white organization, um, including our writers. And that largely stems from the fact that we're a 100% volunteer organization. So um, without the resources to be able to properly compensate people, um, our writer pool is, uh, it consists of people who are in a privileged position where they can take on unpaid volunteer work. Um, so we're very aware of that and we are trying to explore um, a way that we can start to pay writers and that we can start to make this a sustainable thing in the long term. And once we are able to figure out how to start compensating people for their work, then the primary focus is going to be diversifying our contributing writer team so that our contributor team reflects that same diversity that we're trying to cover and highlight with the artists on our platform. Yeah, and for me, that was a surprise. I didn't know that all the team was voluntary. It's amazing for all the fantastic work uh, and platform that you guys provide for new music. And uh, I recently, I was just going through the videos as well. It's a fantastic way of learning uh, new composers, new repertoire. And if you don't know the, the website, please visit. I'm sure, I'm sure people know it. That's why you're here watching, of course. <laughs> um, just to focus a little bit on female composers, what was your experience uh, in your musical education? Just is really my curiosity because I actually only came across the knowledge of the amount of women in music a couple, like five years ago, six years ago. And uh, this for me, of course, I think now we have so many new platforms uh, promoting diversity but I still find so many people who still don't know of them. So when did you come across uh, your own ignorance? And I use this word because that's how I use it for me because I, I was uh, ignorant of this repertoire. And do you still find that people in the business have this ignorance and how can we do better to promote and to tell them guys the information is out there <laughs> but let's go for the first one first uh, yeah we were aware yeah too complicated too long too long of a question gabrielle okay we'll get into all of it but we'll break yeah. it down um yeah. i think the first time i was aware that female composers existed um, was maybe a little bit earlier than some because as a flutist, um, we have a fantastic concert piece by Chaminade, which is uh, on a lot of the high school audition lists or college audition lists. So, um, but I remember not necessarily um, processing at first yeah. that uh, this was a, a woman composer. Um, and then when I was doing my undergraduate degree, um, going through the music history sequence of courses, um, I remember learning about Clara Schumann and Fanny Mendelssohn. And I think I ended up writing some sort of undergraduate research paper on, on the two of them and how their careers were, they, they, they paled in comparison to their, their male family members. Um, but it wasn't until I started writing for I Care If You Listen and started becoming more involved in contemporary music that I realized just how many mm -hmm. composers were out there and active and alive and well and um, how diverse and vibrant the scene is and how varied their music is. And um, that, was, that was a real eye opener because going to orchestra concerts, studying in music school. I mean, it's not in the curriculum. It's not in the repertoire. It's still not something that is um, regularly included or programmed. So, um, I mean, I think things are starting to change now. People who are in charge of music theory or music history curriculums are starting to include more pieces by um, women composers from throughout history and also um, contemporary women composers. Uh, I think the same for orchestras. Orchestras are starting to make that change, but it's the orchestras that have really progressive music directors that are really yeah. starting to make that change. And it's not, um, 
it's still not the case across the board. No, definitely not. I find uh, the change quite slow. If you think of all the amazing resources we have to to find this music, and we were talking about this with Rob Deemer a couple of weeks ago, the fear now with this pandemic is will people see it as an opportunity? Now, orchestras, for example, okay, we're not selling tickets, so we have the opportunity to um, do live, sh live concerts and present a more diverse program. Or will they do the opposite? Will they just you know, keep the safe repertoire because they, they, they need uh, people to stay in contact with them and watching you know, the, the, the same programs? And it's, it's very difficult to know what's gonna happen. Um, it is. Um, and I think it, we also have to acknowledge that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting already marginalized communities. Um, and so now more than ever, um, underrepresented and marginalized artists need our support. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's so hard to say what's going to happen at the end of all of this. The arts scene in the US was already so fragile before the pandemic um, because we have very little uh, government support for the arts here. And so a lot of these institutions or smaller organizations, they're, they're running on smaller grants, they're running on individual donations. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to say what the landscape of the arts will look like once we've reached the other side of this yeah and in your in your job um do you meet these now i'm gonna go to the second part of the question <laughs> so do you happen to meet uh do you still meet people that will have this the same ignorance that we have in terms of the knowledge of programming uh and how do you make them curious and i think that's always the question for all of us that have an initiative how how to convince uh somebody or in an artistic director in a or in an orchestra or in a, any performance arts uh of changing this mentality uh, i know um that sometimes you don't have to have a lot of people with prejudice, but if you have a couple of people with prejudice in certain positions, that might stop things moving forward. What's your in your experience with the people you meet in the business? How do you find the scenery behind the, the stage? The most dangerous thing is that a lot of people consider themselves to be progressive, but there are such ingrained systemic biases that people don't even recognize that they have. So it's not even necessarily the case that the most dangerous people are the ones who have overt prejudice. It's the people who think that they're progressive but are still culturally conditioned to center whiteness in everything that they do. Um, and so that's very difficult because it ties into these conversations that we're having globally about race and representation and discrimination and how racism is still running rampant through so much of our day-to-day -day lives. So it's, it's the same conversation. And when you try to bring it up to, to people, a lot of times they feel personally attacked because if you're saying, you know, your programming is discriminatory, they see that as, as an attack on them personally and their character. And it's like, oh, well, are you saying I'm a bad person? Are you saying that I'm racist? Um, and no, so, <laughs> but, it, the, you know, I, I, I grew up in the Northeast of the United States, which historically votes very liberal. Um, everyone is, is takes pride in the fact that they are often very highly educated, takes pride in the fact that they have um, liberal ideologies and, and are socially, uh, think of themselves as very accepting. But even still, um, people are ignorant and people don't recognize the ways in which 
um, racism and discrimination still exist. And when you try to point it out to them, since they think of themselves as being so progressive, then, mm -hmm. then they see it as a personal attack. So it's, it's difficult. Um, and then you also more specifically in the arts have people who, um, they, they make the argument of, I don't care who wrote it. I just want to listen to good music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but again, yeah. we, we've been culturally conditioned to believe that Western art music, a very specific type of music is the end all be all. It's, it's what we should hold on a pedestal. The, this idea of the, the white male composer genius. And so it's like, oh, well, if women composers or if composers are of color wrote good music, then we'd know about them. And it's like, no, that's not the case at all. Um, there are just so many reasons why we don't know about this music in a very public and widespread way um, because there are just so many barriers to entry in our field. And so um, it's it's difficult. It's really difficult to have these conversations with people without triggering that response, um, which often just shuts the conversation right down. Yeah, because I think people get defensive, you know, because you're, you're probably telling them they, sh they don't know enough and it's true. And I think you would have to be very mature uh, and and willing to open your eyes. I think because it, we don't we can't know everything. And this morning I was just telling you before as well. I was talking to Deborah Cheetham, and she was telling us so many things that I wasn't aware, historically speaking. And 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 then you feel so ashamed. You just feel, oh my God, how was I was not aware about this. And but I think sometimes. It's very hard if you're in a position and you realize, oh my God, I've been neglecting all this talent uh, and it's all my fault. But so you have two options, either you change or you just know, but I'm right. Uh, I have to keep, keep going. I have this position. Right. And a lot of people get so caught up in that feeling of being embarrassed for not knowing something that it completely shuts them down from doing anything else about it. And it's, it's difficult. It's a really uncomfortable position to be in, but we're all going to have to make ourselves a little bit uncomfortable if we really want change to happen. Exactly. How, how is your view? Um, I do have a few women who come to me sometimes or comment uh, that they don't really like to be called women composers or female composers, which I totally agree. You know, you are a, a composer. And, and sometimes this idea of separating uh, women in putting a concert, uh, just featuring women, it can also be seen a little bit like, let's not do that, let's try to, to mix them up. But sometimes the idea of having, I don't like calling it a quota, or, but really focusing on them and giving them a bigger space, I find it very necessary because we don't have equality. If we did have equality, we wouldn't need to have the projects like this uh, and diversity. Um, but again, it says the conversation, how do you find the balance between uh, not creating a special category? They're not women composers, they're composers. And that's always the question I'm asking myself as well to sort of, how can I do this uh, the best way I can? And I, I'm sure sometimes I get it wrong and, uh, and I will have to acknowledge that. And not everything works for everybody. I, I've done full concerts with women composers. I've done concerts which I inserted, which I always prefer this 50-50 approach, which I find more interesting. But but what what are your views on that as well? Because I think if we're trying to, if the goal is equitable programming, then that doesn't exclude people who have um, historically been in the majority. So if we're talking about equity, it's, it's an accurate representation of all of the voices that are active in the field right now. So um, I agree that it can be helpful sometimes to present um, like a dedicated concert 
uh, of say women composers to help raise awareness. But then if you're not also integrating women composers into your regular programming, then it does kind of reinforce this sense of otherness. And it's this sense of this is a separate category of, of people and they're still not worthy of being on our main stage productions or our, you know, our main concerts throughout the season. So I think, I think it's a balance. Um, I've also seen specific commissioning initiatives that are looking for um, mm -hmm. diverse voices. And so I think that's also a good place to start, but um, yeah, it, it does get really dangerous when when you're presenting these all woman composer programs or here um, in February, it's always the, the Black History Month program. And then you don't see a single other black composer anywhere else on their on their season. And so that's not helping because it's just reinforcing this idea of these people are this other thing, which is very much not what we're what we're trying to do yeah it's true and it's quite funny because i launched donne on international women's day 2018 and my vision of the day changed so much in only two years because i was i was so kind of convinced this is the day i'm going to do it i was going to launch on this day because and now i find the day quite depressing because on this year it's so much it's so much on that week so many conferences, uh, so many concerts, uh, so many talks and workshops, and, and even if in the whole month is too much. And then it goes quiet for the rest of, of the year. And it's the same now with talk when we're having talks about Black Lives Matter and racism, and then suddenly the fear is the conversation dies out, and then something else needs to happen for this conversation appear again in our lives and this is really really sad and i think it's our challenge uh, as artists individually uh, to always remember that and i think even i f i feel i wish i could go back in time as an artist uh, actually to to be able to start doing what i try to do now in my own concerts uh, 10 years ago because yeah, I, I wish that I could go back to the days where I was performing regularly and yeah. and program more diverse composers on all of the recitals that I was doing for degree requirements. I, I wish I could do that too. And and I think um, you know, you said you you look back now on having launched your initiative on International Women's Day and and you're now you're like, I'm not sure how I feel about having having done yeah. that. And you know, I, I have moments like that too. And I think as we're all just trying to figure out the best way to help, we're going to make mistakes. And I think we just need to own our mistakes and just keep learning from them and keep moving forward. Um, you know, I still remember um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to interview a collective of women composers who had um, collaboratively composed this work. And um, I was just so excited that it was this group of amazing women. And, um, you know, the interview kind of focused on the fact that they were all women instead of focusing on their art. And um, their responses kind of reflected that and, and also like a little bit of a frustration with that. And that's something that was like a major lesson for me. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I still think about all the time. Um, and, you know, you, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to not go about something the right way. And if people are kind enough to point that out to you, and if people are have have the energy to try to help you be better, at, then, you know, you just have to take that in stride and, and own it and try to do better the next time. Exactly. I think uh, you're going to make mistakes when you're doing something. So it's better to, to, to be actively doing something. Um, in terms of, and we are, I think this is also important in terms of education, how much uh, it's important that we include these stories when we, and because uh, I missed these stories when I was younger, you know, when I was in school, um, inspirational stories. Um, 
and I, of course you you you're working more with a Suzuki is a music uh, school but do you find even there do you find people talk about diversity composers I know it's a different method but do you think there's space it there is. for conversation it's interesting um so I mean Dr. Suzuki was a Japanese pedagogue, um, but the majority of the teaching repertoire for Suzuki is still these historically white male composers. Um, and Dr. Suzuki wrote a couple of, you know, like yeah. etudes that are thrown in there too. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's not something that really comes up but I was actually pleasantly surprised a couple of days ago to see that a few of the teachers at our school have been paying attention to the conversations that are happening nationally and are trying to start um, an anti-racism book club of sorts where um, as a faculty and staff, we can read some of these resources and have space to talk about them. And you know, the role of educators is so important and we have, we have a relatively diverse student body and mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to consider how to best support these young people, especially when, um, you know, part of the whole Suzuki philosophy of education is, is not just teaching young children how to be virtuosos on their instrument. It's really about like character development and teaching people to be part of their communities and teaching young children to have self-respect and a sense of like a feeling of responsibility to their peers and to others. And so, um, you know, if that's, if that's really what we're trying to teach, then I think we need to pay attention to these national conversations. So yeah, I, I was pleasantly surprised to see that some of the teachers have kind of taken up this initiative. Yeah, because it's so important. I, I find crucial more than, um, ever now that we start having these conversations as early as possible and more like on a personal uh, level who are your role models and and now now and before you know because you're in a, such a a great position and but I, I can I can imagine that you, you know I, as I find myself you find like oh am I am I doing what I should be doing and who are the people you look up for or are you that guide you and because you you wanting or not you are now a role models for so many other women who can aspire to be in your position uh, as a woman an editor in a magazine with the power to actually create stories that can inspire other people so who inspires you I think it's changed so much based on, um, you know, my my current discipline. Um, so when I was a young person, I had some really influential um, women, like public school music teachers, um, who really inspired me to want to go into music. And um, I think for a lot of people in the U.S., their like high school band director or their um, high school orchestra conductor. Um, th those are such influential positions, those public school music educators, because, um, you know, I was always taking private lessons or studying on studying flute um, more intensely elsewhere. But that's that's often the, the gateway, those public school music programs. Um, and then, you know, when I was when I was in school, um, I had a couple of flute teachers who I had um, an incredible bond with who uh, were really guiding me in that way. Um, but yeah, as, as things have changed, it's, it's really evolved. And what's interesting is you, you ask who, who I look to now as, as role models and, and journalism has traditionally been such a male dominated field. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, you know, I mean, I, I have to acknowledge the the founder of I Care If You Listen, Thomas de Neuville, who has been an incredible mentor and supporter of mine and has really trusted me in handing off this platform that he built to me um, and has just taught me pretty much everything I know about running an online platform. Um, but it has just been so selfless about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, different people at different points in my life have been really highly influential, but and Thomas, I, I would say is pretty much solely responsible for getting me to where I am today. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, 
we're gonna open for question in four minutes if anybody wants to ask Amanda. But um, before, um, I just wanted to continue a little bit more on this fight for equality in programming of seasons. And uh, when we started the project, I did a, a research on the top 15 orchestras as listed per gramophone a couple of years ago just to check what was being included and the results were really bad it was i think it was 2.3 percent and that was not a 50 50 program it was just if it included one piece by a woman in a concert <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so um then we repeated a year later and there was like i don't know one percent growth or a 0 0.5 and uh, this year I haven't done it yet because, of course, this new programming is it's, it's very difficult with the pandemic. And I have a bad feeling that the result might just, whatever progress we had, might just go back a little bit. And it is difficult to take, um, we need to take the pandemic into consideration. Um, but in your opinion, then, what do you think is still the main reason that people are f not having the courage to to include pieces in big institutions um what's your experience as well as an audience and what the response you see from audiences listening to the new music uh how do you feel they 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 would receive a more diverse repertoire because what i hear is that that's the greatest fear of anybody uh, organizing a new program, that the audiences will abandon them and they will not sell tickets. But from my personal experiences, every time I perform something new, provided that is well explained and there is a context and then you, you deliver this music properly, there is, a, there is space for a lot of diversity. But What's your experience of that? And, and if, it, if we don't see the change as fast as we should be seeing uh, as, as results, what else do you think we can do? I uh, think you've basically answered your own question. I would have said the exact same things. <laughs> I think, um, you know, especially in the US where um, a lot of orchestras are dependent on not only ticket sales, but donations in order to mm -hmm. run. Um, it's it's like a double threat of, of losing audience members and supporters because not only are they purchasing tickets, but then they're also making a point of, you know, donating to the orchestra on an annual basis to keep things going. So I think there's just this fear of if we suddenly start programming different music, then we're going to lose our support. Um, but also, I mean, at least in the US, orchestra audiences are predominantly like people over age 50 or 60, and they're not capturing new audiences. So mm -hmm. I just wonder if, I just wonder how the donor base would change. I wonder how ticket sales would change if people started seeing more living composers, more diverse composers on the stages, if people were actually seeing themselves reflected in these performances, mm -hmm. then you know how how would that change? So I think you're you're exactly right with that. It's this fear of losing audience engagement that that really drives it. But also having predominantly white people in decision making positions um, on like boards for organizations or as the operating staff, and if no one is really there to insist that things be done differently, then um, then I think that's where we see this greatest challenge happening um, because it's, it's easier to just go with what you know than try something new. There is one type of media we didn't talk about, which is radio. Do you deal uh, with radio stations? Uh, I don't personally. No, but then, because for me, I think radio stations, I, I get really angry at them because I think they have uh, a, a huge power, uh, especially here in the UK, you have Classic FM uh, with this amazing uh, audience uh, and, and they could, in my opinion, be doing so, so much more 
uh, gently in, intro, introducing new pieces, making and there there are initiatives for that. But again, if they are special in a special day or or in a spe specific time instead of like something that happens throughout the day. Um, and yeah, I get so the, frustrated with um, the local classical music station here in the, the Boston area because it is classical with a capital C, like classical era. It is a very narrow window of repertoire that they play. Um, and I just, I get so frustrated with it. Um, but then there are individual broadcasters who are making a point of using yeah. their position to really diversify their spots that they're in charge of. Mm -hmm. um, so I think probably the person that immediately comes to mind for me uh, in the US is Garrett McQueen, who um, is the host of a fabulous podcast called Triloquy. Um, but he is also responsible for the programming for Music Through the Night for American Public Media. And so, um, you know, he has a platform and is really using it to diversify what would ordinarily be your standard classical music fair. Um, so I think individual broadcasters are starting to make more of a change. But, um, but often, I mean, it's my understanding that sometimes the people who are the hosts of these shows are just given lists and are in charge of just merely introducing things. So I think it takes a concerted effort um, to really get those lists diversified. We have a question from Eric. Eric is our uh, historical research uh, volunteer. Hello, Eric. Uh, and he works so hard. My God, and I just want to acknowledge this here. Um, every composer you see on our daily blog since January 2019, we start posting two new composers every day. We never repeat them. They're organized by date of birth. And, and it's all done by Eric. Uh, and so um, he probably knows a lot more about everybody uh, all the new composers uh, than anybody that I know. Thank you, Eric. So it's for the both of us. Don't you both think much progress has been made in the last few years? You go first, Amanda. I mean, yes, this isn't to discount all of the progress that we have made. It's just that while some institutions are taking it very seriously and trying to make a concerted effort to make make these changes happen. There are other institutions that are just not making any effort at all. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the frustration comes from seeing that it can be done and that there are still institutions that are refusing to even take the first step toward any sort of progress. Yes, I, um, I have seen much progress in the last few years, but I think the progress came really quickly in uh, as a reaction uh from the hashtag me too you know there was a a moment that we had a, a few years ago that it really um in my in my opinion um reinforced all these initiatives like this project and other projects uh like kind of highlighted and it brought these uh, projects to life and i think as a result of that we saw uh, a bigger change in the past two years, three years. But then I think my my fight and at the moment like uh, is I find now that, okay, now we, we know it existed, uh, but what are we doing now? Then we're not progressing uh, as fast as we should. So in that sense, Eric, I feel, yes, we have made a lot of progress, but I feel we should be moving faster now and I just feel okay um, this is not happening uh, but and and also something that you just said was you know this all launched because uh, a lot of this launched in a response to me too but the the danger of this kind of reactionary change is that it only happens when it's trendy um, and we're seeing that 
a little bit right now in the U.S. with all of these protests against police brutality um, for about a week, everyone was all like, yeah, Black Lives Matter. And now everyone's just like back to their regular posting on social media and they're losing enthusiasm and energy for it. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about primarily like white people who all of a sudden were uh, experienced some sort of awakening to these issues yeah. and then now are just they're like, oh, okay, well, I said that I support black people. And so then, okay, now I'm done. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think we see that reflected in the arts too, where change happens when there's pressure and when, um, when it's popular to do so, but then it's, it's about making a sustained effort. Yeah. And I think that was, uh, I felt the same because I saw so many and then I recognized again so many uh, institutions that never talked about diversity and they all kind of oh yeah i'm gonna raise this flag and I, i'm supporting and and you just question okay so that means you're gonna change now and you know we almost know the answer not really you, you we haven't seen a massive a massive change we hope i hope we will see i mean in some of them because sometimes moments like this they are eye opening for for some people and some institutions and we I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sure this moment is still happening for, for all of us. Uh, in terms of, we always have, we always have so much to learn and to, so much to acknowledge as artists, and uh, and we have so just to be kind and and uh, and to be aware and to listen. I think that's because uh, we are very, we have a tendency to. We need to speak. We need to speak, and uh, and sometimes you just have to listen, and that's so. That's what I think we should be all doing at the moment. Yeah, and in addition to, um, I think there's been a lot of frustration with organizations who have just um, put out these statements of support, but with no real um, concrete steps toward actually addressing the issues that we have. So listening is so important in that too. Um, just listening to what people are expressing is needed and then being willing to internalize that and being willing to actually act on those requests. Um, and so I think right now, a lot of people just want to see actionable steps that people are going to take to make a difference. It's like, okay, yeah, that's great that you support yeah me but what are you going to actually do about it so yeah i mean i think i think a lot of times um growing up in a white centric society we um we feel like we always need to insert ourselves and talk and express our opinions um but there's a lot to be said for just taking a step back and listening yeah i forgot to include the um you guys should all watch these videos on intersectional feminism, number one. And then I'm also going to add the link to I Care If You Listen and your personal website as well. Great. And know even more about uh, Amanda. And as my last question, unless anybody else has another question, is what would be your advice so uh, i'm sure there are lots of people out there who are still afraid of new music uh, even classical music lovers or they feel they they there there is sometimes the stigma that you need to know a lot about before you can actually go to a concert uh, that will play contemporary music uh, people have not the preju uh, prejudice and fear i find even uh, with amongst musicians amongst colleagues so what's your advice for newbies in new music uh, how would you start what kind of uh, what's your guide what apart from your um, the I care if you listen which is a fantastic uh, place to start and uh, explore but composers or some works that you would recommend that people uh, start if they want to in, in, embark in this journey of contemporary music? Yeah, I mean, 
the the number one thing that I would say is that so much contemporary music is way more accessible now than what people think of as new music. It's, I mean, while people are still writing very um, sort of complex, dense works now um, that aren't necessarily um, an easy entryway <laughs> into new music, um, there is so much more accessible work happening. Um, so I would say just in general as a concert goer, the contemporary music, at least in the US, that is performed on orchestral concerts, a lot of times still falls into this very um, complex version of new music. So if your only exposure to contemporary music is at an orchestra concert, it's likely going to confirm your suspicions of what new music is. Um, so instead, I would recommend seeking out some sort of local chamber ensemble or independent artist who is presenting uh, contemporary music because often the programs are much more diverse and being able to hear multiple pieces of contemporary music back to back, it just highlights the diversity and um, how varied uh, the, the field is right now. I would also mm -hmm. recommend seeking out programs that either have some sort of pre-concert talk or something that is engaging the audience in a way where it's going to give you more insight into what you're about to hear. I think people are better now about breaking that fourth wall and actually talking to audiences and engaging with audiences. Um, it's no longer, you know, you have to process out and take your bow and you must never talk to the audience. And um, <laughs> so I think just finding concerts where, where people are actually, um, planning to engage with the audience in some sort of meaningful way is helpful. And we try to set up I Care If You Listen in a way where it's easy to discover new music, um, especially now that we're doing more multimedia content. So I would just check out the, the video offerings that we have on the site um, as a good way of finding some new listening. And uh, there, we have a very good question, which I'm just going to uh, show in a minute but before it's it's really true because I think as a musician even myself until I started to perform more contemporary music we all had this stigma of I think it's the John Cage approach when you're gonna watch nothing for four minutes and a half and then you're gonna have to pretend mm. but and, and the, <laughs> the more the more I the more I learn especially with the project all these new composers it's it's fascinating because you forget that is their voice they're telling their stories and they're telling their cultural stories or or something that was meaningful to them and it's fascinating and it's it's so easy so accessible and so i, I would say exactly the same the new new music or the the very new new music it's uh, it has this language which just a person's uh, voice and uh, and like any other music there will be some voices or some ways of expressing that you're gonna identify more or you're gonna like more than others and that's totally fine but it doesn't stop us to keep searching you know and keep uh, trying to explore Right. Exactly. And I mean, trying to get people to like contemporary music is not saying a blanket statement of you must like all contemporary music. Um, I mean, I hear things that I don't like all the time. Um, and so it's just about being able to engage as a listener, being able to have an open mind. And it's there's there's not this heavy expectation that, like you said, you have to sit there and be like, hmm, yes, yes, I, you know. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, I think I have to read uh, the rest of the questions not going to fit on the screen. So beyond playing music of Bain BIPOC composers within our programs, how much do you think we need to acknowledge the race of those composers in the marketing, copy, etc.? Obviously, a generalization. Sorry, but would be great to hear your ideas about acknowledgement. Yeah, um, I, this is something where um, I think it really needs to come from a place of genuinely wanting to uh, engage with BIPOC composers as 
people, um, not just as a statistic or a box to be checked. If you're going to program the music of a living BIPOC composer, reach out to them, talk to them, get to know them as a person, see if you can get them somehow involved in the presentation of the programming, um, whether it be a pre-concert talk or maybe some sort of interview or blog post or something in advance of the programming. And through that, be able to come up with a clear plan and concept for how that person wants to be represented. Um, because I think a lot of times we want the beautiful tiled image of all these diverse composers so that in the marketing, it can be like, oh, look at all of these people that we're programming. But uh, sometimes those efforts um, end up representing people in a way that they're not comfortable being represented. So, um, I would say that in terms of acknowledgement, that's something that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and that has to come from a place of genuinely wanting to engage with composers as complete people. I, that's a, that's a, it's, it's something that I never thought about it, you see? <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's, it's so true, yeah, because I can imagine people trying to make everything to to blend and and, and there's so many diverse backgrounds that sometimes uh, it's so important to you again to listen to the people themselves well amanda thank you so much i think um i think we don't have more questions and i just wanted to thank you once again thank you kelly uh for your time for being so open, uh, we actually never uh, met or exchanged any emails until uh, I saw this opportunity now that with the pandemic, I have a bit more time to, to be more uh, connected with the project. And I really wanted to have as many conversations as possible until I have uh, and, and this, this time, which is so precious. Uh, and it's been amazing for me and uh, I, I hope for everybody watching and very soon uh, we'll make all these videos available on YouTube as well, which I think is going to be easier for people to find it and and actually watch it. Um, you have Amanda's personal website as well as I care if you listen on the comments. Uh, if I may, I will ask you all to stay in touch with us. Donne on social media because we have this uh, powerful tools now in social media which can help us to amplify uh, stories, amplify conversations and uh, if you couldn't watch today or if you know of somebody who will appreciate this talk uh, it would be great if you could spread the word and, and keep us send us questions uh, send direct to Amanda as well. And thank you so much once again. And um, I hope we stay in touch. We certainly will. Yeah, thank you so much again for reaching out. It's always so nice to be connected to new people, especially people who are all trying to work toward making these changes happen. So thank you so much for arranging this. My pleasure. And good luck uh, with everything um, through this uh, challenging times uh, for all of us in America. And, but we are all connected here and I hope we are, these conversations can help others and inspire other young women to become a woman like you. Well, thank you. That's very <laughs> kind. <laughs> no, but you know, we need uh, women of all backgrounds, of course, in, in positions of leadership to help to continue this conversation going absolutely uh, and i think uh, it's it's amazing that you 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 can be a role model for so many so yeah and thank you so much for the work that you're doing as well and i think the more that we can all just be having these conversations together the better yes i learn a lot from this project on a daily basis so for me the reward is very high thank you all for watching and uh, we'll be back next week and as i said very soon i will do, uh, put all the videos uh, oh we had seven conversations so far and they're all amazing and so different and really enriching uh, they all complement each other so please come back soon and um, stay connected with us take care <laughs>